a walk through an auger installation. And I have, um, I'm basically going to take you from the very beginning of the process all the way through the end. And so I'm going to share my, I'm going to share my whole screen and I need to know if the computer screen is too big. And if it is, then I can just share parts of it. But I'm going to start by trying to just share the whole thing so that I can go from like the web browser to other places. Um, <clears throat> can you read, can people read that okay or is it too small? It's a little small, but it's, 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 it's in full screen mode, you can read it. Yeah, I can read it. Okay. I can read it. Okay. Maybe. I have a question before we start, Sean. Is yeah. this Sean? Um, a Help. clean virtual environment or is this already stuff pre-installed? Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna start you from the full creation of the virtual environment. So we're gonna go through all the steps today. So if, um, if you come to the Augur um, page, there's now a link uh, to documentation, which opens up our readthedocs.io account and gives you basic information. The link gave us the getting started and then takes us to installation. Um, these are the things that you'll need. Uh, Git client, GitHub access token, Python, pip, uh, Postgres 11, 12 should work fine. We haven't tested it on 12 yet, but it, there's no big changes there that would be problematic. And so the first thing that we would do is um, clone Augur. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna put other windows here. And I'll make this bigger. So it's easier to see. So I have a GitHub directory and a chaos directory where I've got a couple of things in here. So I'm going to do a git clone and I'm going to put it in a different directory called auger2 just so it's completely fresh. <coughs> and so that takes a few, maybe like 60 seconds to clone on my wireless network. If I'm at home, it clones much faster, but I'm on campus right now, subject to the Severe limitations of our campus network. I'm on Tiger Wi-Fi. I'm not even on Tiger Wi-Fi. It's like, oh, it's oh, it's the oh, yeah, you're right. You're on here. I got my own. I have a rogue router in my office because this would be even slower if I was on the default Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. it's all the other stuff. Yeah. And so uh, while we're waiting, it is worth mentioning, Sean. If you go back to the the documentation. Yeah. Um, that what is Augur page that we skipped over, that doesn't actually have any super, um, it doesn't have any code or installation instructions. It's just for people who are brand new to the project, have no idea what we are. Just a quick primer on what we're doing, why we're doing it, and who's doing it. So I think most of the people on the call are pretty familiar with us. So we can just go ahead and start with this section. Should be getting there. Yeah, so while we are waiting, when we tried the installation, was it last week? We had used the README in the top level. On the yeah, repo. we've pushed all the changes to master now so that everything is uh, clear in master as well as dev. We hadn't merged the changes in dev uh, to master last yeah. week. All right, so now awesome. I have Thank you. this uh, oops, LS. So now I have my Augur2 directory. And the next instruction is to create a Python virtual environment. Hopefully I don't have one called this already, but I might. Um, oh, you have to specify Python 3. Yeah, so I have Python 2 and 3. <coughs> Excuse me. No, I don't even know if I. Yep, there you go. OK, so and then. Should probably add something if you have both Python two and three. You want to create a three environment. So if you go, so if you do the commands. Which command? The one you just copied. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go back to documentation, right here, be sure to use the correct Python command. I can make that bigger because some people well, will probably just not read it. Um, I'll probably I'll put it in line with the documentation yeah. or with the actual code, so it's more visible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because otherwise, people will. Yeah, you're right. People will just copy that. All right, so now I've activated the environment, and I want to CD into my Augur directory, which is sort of obvious, but 
we maybe should put that in there. It is. Oh, it is. Okay. I didn't read it, obviously. All right. So then I would run make install. <coughs> And this takes a minute as well. The first time you install Augur, it downloads all the Python packages that are required. Every time you install it after this, all it will do is update yep. anything that needs to be updated. And most often, if we're updating a package, it's because we've got a notification on GitHub that there's a new version. Mm -hmm. GitHub's gotten really excellent about identifying when there's a security issue with something that's in your, in your repository. Mm -hmm. And they actually have a bot now. Many of you may know that automatically will create pull requests for you to update your your required versions in your requirements file. Very nice. Super, nice. Very sweet, yeah. <clears throat> so now we're going through all the workers and installing all of them. Yeah. In the version that y'all looked at last week, we had prompted you to install every worker, and I said that we don't need to do that. So I'm going to do, in, in my case, somebody just posted there, <coughs> chat plus one from, okay. Uh, Uh, the oh, thing yeah. with okay. using uh, Python 3 is that some people, uh, I don't want to assume that people have Python 3 mapped to uh, Python 3. For example, on my computer, I've mapped Python regularly to be Python 3. Um, so I'd rather not make that assumption. It may right. be, in more cases than not, it probably would be Python 3, but that's yeah. something I would have to see what most people do and what Python's recommended way of doing it is. <clears throat> I just went based off my own experience, but yeah. I'm one person. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Python three would be fine. Okay. Any questions thus far? I should pause and breathe for a moment just to. Janet says there's no questions since nobody said anything. Andy posted a question in the chat. Yep. And uh, oh, I'm getting a red error message. In the it depends entirely on what the message is. Yeah. Um, if you're doing, if you not sure, what, is it like pip doesn't work or? If you've activated your virtual environment, it should be included as long as you've got PIP installed on your computer. So I, I have activated my uh, virtual environment using Python 3. Okay. And uh, I ran make install, and um, I just saw a ton of red error messages. I mean, it didn't fail halfway through. It kept going. There is um, one. We had one on ours uh, for a package that's not available, which sometimes happens. Can you, can you give us the specific error message? This, is this the one yes. that you're seeing? Well, uh, let's see. Um, I know I know what that error is. That's a typo in a command that I thought. I, yeah, it's, uh, it's similar to that. Uh, yeah. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, that Would it make sense, something make from, sense to I, switch the screens and let Andy show a screen? Uh, I can do uh, why don't we do that? We can, why don't we come back to your question after we finish this installing? And that's fine. Okay. So um, you can install it with a local database. I don't really want to run Postgres on my laptop, so I'm going to select a remote Postgres installation. Um, and in my case, the database is Father Goggins and the host. And the port in my case. So why make the distinction between local and remote if, for um, option one and two? Really, in my mind, I had them create that because local host might not be assumed. And I think when it's local, we don't prompt for the host name. We don't. So you can just we can just fill in data for you. I just moved myself off screen here because I'm entering passwords. Oops. And I just fat fingered the password and put a slash in. Yeah, I think for, for me, it would be more logical to ask, do you already have the schema installed or not? And then if it's local, I just type in local host as my host's location. That makes sense. We could uh, make, make a note of that. Yeah. Sorry, I installed a nefarious character. So that actually, Georg, that's option three. It, it says installation with Augur database. It should say Augur schema, um, but that that is uh, that situation is covered. But I'll, I'll double check if that's actually 
So no, my criticism, my suggestion was only right now, the question asks two different things. One is, is it local or remote? And one is, does it have a schema? Does it not have a schema? And there, so there are four options total, but you only show three. And really it's necessary only to ask one question, whether you have the schema or not. And then I, that's my suggestion. Are you on Oh, okay. All right. So I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Um, Burger made a small fix right beforehand on yeah. the web. So <laughs> All right, wrong brand. I, I taken it off screen because I was entering my GitHub API key and I didn't want that in the reporting. Um, so I'm just going to start over and it won't have to install everything. Yeah. That part was our fault. I'll get out of check to see if any file built up is already. Uh, you know what, no. Because most of the time I won't do anything. So well, apparently it created my auto.config.json. Did you have one already? No, but it probably created it. I like, think it just, yeah, it did. Yeah. All right. Well, this is um, All right. I ran the wrong version and uh, it created an auger that could that case and that was wrong. Yeah. So basically, uh, if you have a config and you run the install, it won't ask you to create one again, because most of the time if you're installing it again, you probably just want to keep the same config. Um, since we ran it on the incorrect version the first time, uh, it had already created the config with nothing in it. And so now that we've removed it, it will show in front of this again. There we go. And now I'm going to do my remote and the database is auger goggins. There we go. Augerwebs.io port. Auger. I'm just going to take the password off screen. Andy, do you mind if I mute you? The typing comes through. So hmm. it's prompting me for the wrong user's password right now. And that's what I thought Carter was fixing. But, uh, that's what I also thought I fixed. So, All right, so database, that database has got to be Um, no password supply. Okay, so there's something wrong with the database config on the installation still. That's my fault. Um, so now I'm going to install Augur's front end dependencies. I ran into that uh, no password supplied error as well when I tried yeah. it. Yeah, so Carter's working on fixing that right now. He thought he had fixed it. The problem is Carter's machine has installed Augur many times, so we need to get him a different machine to use. He needs to stop installing it on his own machine. <laughs> and the front end, of, so the back end is all Python. The front end is largely relying on Node Package Manager and PM. So the reason we allow you to make a choice about whether or not to install the front end dependencies is because all the data collection work 
will function independently of the front end. So you could install Augur's back end only and not install the front end and just have a bunch of data that you collect and serve up for other web apps. This takes the longest of all the things that get built for whatever reason. It's just a lot of node compiling. Yeah, which is part of the reason why we asked for that separately, because that's just uh, us trying to fit to different use cases, because some people just want our data in our back end and may go off and build their own front end. So installing all the front end dependencies would be unnecessary. All right, there are a couple of build errors in here, but the system actually works with those errors. Um, I went into that build error as well, so that's good to know that it's, yeah. Um, right now I'm just, uh, okay, so it seems to have created the, an order that config that JSON that's valid, but what I don't know is if it, uh, actually built the schema, it did not. So right now the schema did not get built. Um, uh, well, it's there that you're working on. There is an install script for it looks like if I run set up DB. Yeah, that'll do just that part. Okay. Uh, but it's gonna still have that same issue, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm gonna demonstrate um, what we do if it if that failed. You can always take the um, There we go. I can execute a SQL file and basically there's inside of Augur. Under persistence schema, there's a set of um, scripts that if you run them, We'll just run all the scripts. Should it should work? I guess we're gonna find out. I haven't tried it locally. Persistent schema around that. Yeah, that doesn't work. So I have to run them one at a time. John, could you do the fact that it's necro based on Argo last time I know and not regularly with Argo last time I know? Because I can SSH into Argo last time I know, but not necro. I'm, I'm using mudcaps. I'm not sure what your question is. It should just be the database user.
And then there's some seed data as our last one. Yeah, and this, the install script should do this automatically, but since it didn't, I'm showing you how I hacked around that. So now I should have um, all my schemas in here. And I do. So if I go back to my install, I'll have to do that. Now, if I want to run it, what do I run? The back end? The whole thing. Oh, make that. Make That's what I thought. But. Oops, am I on in the wrong directory? So if you're on make dub, you'll have a working version of Augur on your machine locally. What's the difference between make install and make dev? Make install installs the the um, system, installs Augur, make dev runs Augur. Thank you. So if I go to my local IP address here. And I'm calling over a network to um, a computer in Europe. That's where I put my database. <coughs> and I don't think there's any repos stored. So by default, I don't think there's any data in here. Yeah, yeah. no data, but we so, have the entry. So yeah, this gets you to basically the base install of Augur. And then there's another command for loading data. And Carter, do you want to show us that command? Um, yeah, it's in the document. Okay. So, if so you, make yeah, install. Uh, click on next on the bottom. Ooh. And then scroll down a little bit. So, this is where the make dev command is documented. Mm -hmm. uh, keep scrolling. So, that DB section. Okay. So, uh, basically, what you do is once you've got Augur installed, um, there's a couple, there's a whole family of commands uh, besides Augur run. Um, I've documented a few of them here, but the, the main one for the database is auger db add repos, add underscore repos. And so basically all you've got to do is provide um, a CSV file in the correct format, and it, it explains exactly what the format is, and then uh, sample contents, or contents of a sample uh, CSV file. Um, and then so you do auger db add repos to, and then the path to that file, okay. and it will take, um, <coughs> it will take everything in that file and the database that you specified in your configuration file, and then um, knows how to upload or load those repos uh, that you specified uh, into the database that specified in your configuration file. So if I were to create a repos.csv, just as Carter's down there, no. I could do this command here. Really quick, Sean. Yeah. Uh, can you change the twos to one? That's an example. Okay. So this, so the the format of the repo CSV is um, repo group ID that you want to use, and then the repo the the URL, the Git URL. Um, in this example, it's showing you what it would look like if you had two different. Um, uh, repo groups one and two uh, for the database we just created the only one that was the default one would be one So we just made that change really quick if you had had maybe say five different repo groups You expect with IDs one through five you can specify You know one through five in that repo.csv file But for our purposes since we just got the one repo group we're all going to put them in that one repo group. So we see that we have added the three git repo URLs um, and they've successfully answered each one of them So if we go back to the database it Should be in there that I have to restart it with Nico. Right. So I know that Augur has a JSON file to define the project. Um, have you thought about it using... It defines the parameters, the JSON file, does just the configuration. So the JSON file indicates your ports and stuff. So I'm, I'm talking about the list of repositories to analyze, right? Right. And have you thought about um, using or, or 
uh, standardizing the format between Augur and Grimoire Lab? Is that something you'd be interested in? Uh, it depends on what Grimoire Lab's standard is. I mean, is it a pretty lightweight standard or? Well, it allows for, um, for, th for things like groups and meta information. So, it, but those are optional JSON fields and JSON is a little bit more difficult, in my opinion, to yeah. I mean, write manually we, than a system. Yeah, so the reason we started with this very simple, um, which I can't see anymore, but the very simple JSON structure, or the very simple CSV structure like is specified here is, and we need to add for group creation, like, it, oh, yeah, yeah, like it should automatically create groups or something. But yeah, I can, I can this imagine. makes it this kind of format makes it super easy and lightweight for a completely new person that's not familiar with JSON to just load up a bunch of URLs. So I, I, think, I think optionally allowing people to specify more metadata using the JSON structure that Grimoire Lab uses is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. And this is we should. <laughs> But this is for your, you know, your 10 or 20 person, 20, 20 or 20 repo community manager that just wants to yeah. watch their stuff, probably has only one repo group. This format is, it's a faster starting point. Yeah, and all. we just kind of wanted to get like a proof of concept out the door, like it works. There's a bunch of stuff that exactly like your original yard that would be really, really nice that we definitely need in there. But for right now, this is what I was able to implement. Yeah, no, this is definitely easier. I 100% agree. Uh, just another comment. One of the things that we're discussing in Grimoire Lab is to uh, try to get away from editing the files manually and providing a user interface for yeah. adding repos. Where we have exactly the same priority. That, uh, in fact, I think that's the thing I've asked Carter to do right after we polished up <coughs> this release. Um, Okay. Provide an interface so that people can just put in their own repos and put them in groups. Um, for us, we've, we've not done that up to this point because in our minds, we had thought that we wanted to make sure login was enabled before we allowed people to edit things. But I think where we've landed on that is let's assume a uh, standalone implementation on someone's computer. And if we do that, then they have, they're the only ones with access to this like local host kind of format. and. We could optionally say, do you want your repository admin screen to run or something? Yeah, no, I agree, right? It's all future work. Uh, right. It would just be nice if we, if we could not duplicate the work, but maybe. Yeah, and work, I think, you know, I mean, together. when we go to specifying other metadata, I, I think it would make a ton of sense to use the format that Grimoire Lab is using. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Anyway, that was just the thought yeah. I had. Looking at so this. now you can see that we've um, got everything installed here. Um, we loaded up the repositories that we wanted to add. Um, and then if I go back to, I don't need that anymore. Um, here. I don't know what this is. What is Augur Util Shell? Oh, so that's for um, if you want to test, maybe you're working on a new metric and you want to test to make sure that it works or just what the output looks like, or you're doing some debugging stuff. Um, this makes it really easy to uh, test that metric by just, it drops you into a, an IPython shell in your terminal um, mm -hmm. with Augur already instantiated and an application, an instance of the application already spun up for you. So you can literally just like do that app, print app that metric that issues new. Maybe that's what I'm working on. Um, that way you don't have to like um, put IPDB traces in there. You don't have to try to expose it through an API really crudely and then try to call it. It just makes it really easy to um, to really quickly test and see what you're doing. It's not by any means mandatory or necessary to use, but it's something that I honestly find myself using a lot when I'm trying to trying to debug something with Argo. And then you can run the front end separately. This sort of explains the architecture of each of them that's inside of it. But that's, that is essentially the installation of Augur. Now, if we 
somebody asked the question, what's the difference between make, dev, and auger run? The difference is that with auger run, you're, that is the command that you would use to run it on a server, basically. And you would typically run it in the background, like with a no hub command, and then it would sit there, and that would be the main. So if I ran that right now, And then do you put it on the front end server? Yeah, I do. But the one reason I run, might run auger run like that, where I have this run it running it in the background, that isn't going to run the front end. But what it does do is it allows me to run um, the all of the worker processes um, in the background. So mm -hmm. if I if I was going to do that, um, and this isn't. I don't think this is in the documentation yet, but we're going to add it like right after this call. What is? Um, how to start the workers. Oh, yeah, that's it's, high on the list. Does the switch command work? I'm not sure. It's it, okay. I, it may be worth it. All right. So we'll document how to start the workers and uh, provide that, provide a data collection overview in a subsequent and call. We need to have you could just go to the workers directly and start it with the GitHub worker start thing. Like in a different tab. Like a different, you mean, oh, like a terminal? Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. I, I just want to document it. Well, I guess I could show them. So the workers are, hmm. All, the workers, this is what collects the data. And you can see um, these are the different workers. The, the main ones that you're probably, most interested in are the facade worker, the GitHub worker, the Linux badge worker, and the pull request worker, and the repo info worker. Metric status and value. Value isn't fully developed yet, and metric status is, <coughs> um, it, it, it's a meta worker that we give you the data for anyway, so you probably don't need to run it, but it's there if you want to run your own. And then the insight worker generates things. So if I want to go to the facade worker, and I really don't know. So if I run the facade worker, all the workers are run by basically, I use to, Facade worker. So that's the name of the worker, same as the directory, and then underscore start. That's the syntax to start any of the workers. And we're going to put this on the front end um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, and once that starts, um, it creates a file called worker.log automatically. And then It runs it, and that for a small number, I got an error. Let's see what that is. Okay, the error file is just it's cloning into Augur. It's just cloning all. It's going to clone all the repos and count all the commits. Um, if I go to GitHub Worker, same syntax. GitHub Worker, which is the same as the directory, and then underscore start. Uh, it's going to collect for that. And something we're currently working on is uh, finding a stable way to automatically start a specified number of instances of whichever workers you want just at runtime of Augur. So whenever you run your Augur run or make dev command, it would just start the workers for you. And we've had that working before, so it might still be working. It may but. still be working. Georg, do you know if Grimoire has got workers that actually clone the repo, or do they just pull the API of GitHub? Do, do you know one way or the other? The Percival does clone the repo to collect information about the Git log and who is doing what in the commit history. Thank you. Hmm. 
That's fascinating. I don't really know what that means. I've never seen that before. It may have been unrelated. Um, uh, just use standard Linux commands. You can sort of see what all the workers that you have running are. And so if, if I want to, um, npm run serve is the front end command. which is run for you. Basically, the back end is started for you on make dev, so it does the auger run and it does the npm and serve for you, mm -hmm. or run serve for you. And in the case of, but if I want to run them separately, I can also do that, which is basically what I'm showing you. So now, there should possibly be some data already. Yeah, so I've got, uh, started to get the commit count for auger. Haven't pulled the issues yet. But it's counting commits for auger already. And so once you start the collection, it's basically just going to get data for all the things that you've asked it to get data for. And that's how you run auger and collect data and start doing cool stuff. Any other questions or any questions, I guess, as we've gotten this far, I'm sure there might be some. Um, so I guess, I, I guess just, to, oh, there's an echo. Um, yeah, let me see if I can fix that. Uh, um, let's try that again, Max. So I guess just a question in terms of, so the, the, the make dev runs all the workers and the front end? Um, or yes. so okay. Make dev will run the front end and the back end. And the workers are a separate process that okay. started when you configure there's a, there's a tag called switch in auger.config.json for each of the workers, and it's defaulted to zero. But if you change the default to one, that's going to start the workers when you start auger run. At least, I mean, it, at least it did. And yeah. we, we just haven't tried that recently because <coughs> I didn't want to be bringing up workers every time I was playing with auger, but mm -hmm. um, it, that should work. Yeah, they're generally considered like a separate entity from auger you know so we start and stop them on separate processes generally okay uh, those commands that we had showed so yeah if you if you want to see the architecture of auger essentially the front end is this npm run serve and the back end is auger run mm -hmm. and each of these data sources is a worker command gotcha okay okay so for each directory there's a worker i think the only one that doesn't have a that's fully fleshed out as the value worker, but we have a version of that that should be moving over from a developer branch into production like in the next week or so. That really the hang up there has been me granting our developer correct permissions on the server they're testing it on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, my question is um, well, first of all, uh, I have been able to get the server working. That's awesome, first time. Uh, second is, um, could you guys provide a, a read-only instance of the Augur database for testing? Um, I suppose I'd need an IP address or a host name and a, a username and a password and a port. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we can do that. We, we could at least provide you a, a read-only, we could provide you with a database that's maybe populated that you could install um, with some data. Like we've talked about maybe just like what Grimoire Lab does is they include all of the chaos repositories inside of a, of a sample system. And I think we could do something quite similar uh, to that. I, I think that would be quite doable. Yeah, and then we'll set. That'd be nice.
Any other questions you guys had with the install? Did everything kind of make sense? The weird stuff is the database. Yeah. Carter's not leaving my office until it is. No. Nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll try it again with the, because I think I did it last week and probably so there's some code changes, but I ran into an invalid host header when I tried to, um, when I looked at the, the front end. So, um, but I'll try it again with the new stuff and, and right. run into that again. Uh, are you, what uh, browser are you using? Uh, Firefox. Try it with Chrome. Oh, I've occasionally, okay. I've occasionally run into an issue with, Firefox, and it doesn't seem to concert, occur consistently. It seems to depend on what network I'm on. Um, but sometimes Firefox has a issue with, uh, it's like a C underscore event router or something, where it thinks it's doing a cross host hosting. Okay. I'll try that. Some kind. I've, I've seen I'll that before, that. and I haven't been able to replicate it consistently. It, okay. It does okay. seem to vary based on my local area network configuration. Gotcha. And, Chrome doesn't secure me in the same way against whatever Firefox thinks is happening there. Okay. All right. I'll try that. Are there, oops, are there any other, are there other questions either related to the installation or not related to the installation? Well, if there's if there's time remaining, I still have not got workers um, running, so m maybe um, maybe I missed that. Uh, and if I did, I apologize. But um, but with the time remaining, if we could talk about just dig into the workers a little bit more and talk about that, that that'd be useful for me. Um. So essentially with the workers, the, the most important thing to understand is that they're these separate processes that exist um, and they're all in the workers directory. And the format for starting them is um, really you can actually, so I went into the directory to start them, but <coughs> I'm gonna turn off my front end now so I can show you this. Um, I'm actually, Let me start collecting. Uh, do you have a task in your config? Oh, I bet I bet Carter has not. Um, Sean, is it is it possible just to pick one worker and run it in the foreground, just just kind of as a sure as a testing exercise? Why is this in there? Why is the repo stuck in here? Uh, this is a way of providing tasks. You could give an array of repos okay. as well as just doing a repo group ID. Okay. But um, I think having them both there may cause. So if you want to delete the repos, yeah. Um, and then get rid of that. Because I think oh, right, that's yeah. And then just save that and restart Augur. What is, why is it, uh, why is there a duplicate of it below that? Repo info, I see. Yeah. And so we plan to document this very soon, but the way workers are told what to do um, is through these configurable housekeeper tasks. And um, the housekeeper is an entity we designed that just keeps up with the regulation of tasks that you would specify right there in the config as you saw. And so how it works is once you start up Augur, uh, 
it will read that config file and the housekeeper process will start iterating through repos and sending them out to the workers. Um, yeah. And so, can so the log? Okay, so we see it's booting the housekeeper and the broker, which is actually the distributor of the test. Um, and so it takes a second for. Guys, is it possible to run a worker uh, standalone without the housekeeper? No, you need uh, Augur to be running. The worker, to, the housekeeper, and Augur's main process are control structures that ensure that everything is up to date. Um, so it'd be kind of like, um, I don't know, like a chicken running around with its head cut off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the worker can be alive, but it won't be told what to do, what to work on. Okay. Um, and the purpose of the housekeeper and the broker is to ensure things like logging of the tasks the worker is completing and uh, making sure there's no overlap of tasks and things like that. And so in the auger, Do you mind? Log, sorry, no, that's that mine. Oh. Um, as we see in the log file, the housekeeper started up update processes which just wait until a compatible worker is alive and then the housekeeper will start rolling through those repos and setting them out so we'll go into the workers directory and into the git of workers directory. and actually like i i make a habit of um, going into the directories but it looks yeah. so Andy, I'm, I'm wondering what do you want to accomplish with running them separately? Where, where does that question stem from? Well, uh, um, so my next question was going to be, uh, I'm curious if, if you guys could talk a little bit about how you develop and test workers. And I'm, I'm curious if you are, are using any sort of a strategy of mocking um, the API endpoints of the third party services. Uh, so the the genesis of my question is really about trying to understand your development and test process a little bit more. Yes. I mean, our process for the workers is that we define the structures that exist in a common data model across GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and we we built a I figure out what that is. Um, we we build the workers so that they feed the schema from whatever source there is, the way that we've structured it. So that the structure of the data in Augur is the same regardless of what system, what platform it begins with. <coughs> and the way that we test it is we have two, we have metadata that we collect from the source. So in the case of GitHub, it's GitHub metadata that the repo info worker collects. And we look at the total number of pull requests issues, commits, comments, all of that metadata is returned in the repo info table by the repo info worker. So we look for, in terms of testing the data collection, we match what we've collected um, with the metadata delivered by the platform. And we don't look for a 100% match because the time of collection can be nominally different, but we look for within 0.1% that the, the total counts that we have collected and the total counts that exist in the metadata are the same and most of the time they are identical and occasionally if for example the metadata is collected moments ahead of the the, the worker or hours ahead of the worker it might be stale by one or two issues or pull requests or commits and so we set tolerances for what what's acceptable i mean when something is off or data hasn't been collected the the tall i mean it's uh it's never close <laughs> It's all, it's, you know, when we've tested it and it hasn't worked, it's never close. It's always like, why are we missing all of these issues? <coughs> and, and, you know, there can be all kinds of reasons for that. But um, one of the things that we set up by default, for example, with GitHub is we do what we call a deep collection at the beginning so that we get all of the issues and all of the pull requests and all of their comments. And then once we've validated the, 
the deep collection, we can just get updates from a point in time um, after that. It's the initial, what we call deep collection that uh, sometimes we have to, you know, you want to validate. And we've done most of that validation here. So all of the cases that we've encountered through about six months of testing on the workers so far has have been addressed. So, I mean, we're increasingly confident the workers just get the data. And um, obviously, like anybody using an API, we're vulnerable to changes in the API that break the contract. But GitHub and GitLab are very good about not breaking the contracts they have already in place. And obviously, with mining Git commits, that's you know, that's pretty standard, robust, mature technology. So we've never had any issues with counting commits in, from the Git repository. So um, I'm curious if the workers have got regression tests, and if so, where are the tests in the repo? And and could you just show, just do a quick demo of how you run the regression tests? So regression testing for, so what you're asking is, this is what's tricky about regression testing in the case where the test is the collection of a complete data set is that you really can't have a regression test unless you have a static stable set of repositories that you've cloned at a point in time and are running the tests against them. So because what we're using for for collection and, and using Augur is a constantly moving target. We use the repo info worker and the metadata gathered from the source to test that the data is being completely collected. And so the regression test isn't the, uh, the regression test isn't does the software function does anything change that would change the collection. The regression test is are we getting the complete data set that we expect and that the the source tells us is there. And so our regression testing is focused on the data and not the software. Like we make sure the software runs and we make sure that if it's changed that we've done basic testing that it'll execute. But validating that the program runs as it previously did with a set of regression tests will not guarantee that it actually is collecting all the data it's supposed to collect because we have this contract with a third party. Thank you. The front ends and the, the front end and the API do have regression testing. So that's all in our Travis CI um, configuration. So when you see the dev build successfully, that's the front end, that's the, the APIs, that's the basic execution of Augur. But the things that, since the worker's job is collecting data, um, we, we use regression testing that is essentially in our lab and we don't, we don't have a good platform. And I don't know if, if you know of a platform for doing data centric regression testing where you're basically checking metadata against what you've actually collected. Because that's what we're doing. Um, <coughs> near as I can tell, uh, the Grimoire folks um, just do a manual sort of snapshot of the, of the JSON that is emitted by third party services. Yeah. And, um, uh, so near as I can tell, they don't have an automated way of capturing that snapshot. Um, I have worked with other testing systems that do have an automated way of capturing the snapshot. Uh, there are test systems that I've seen that go by the name of VCR. Okay. Where, you know, there's, there's sort of tooling where you can say, oh, capture, you know, a snapshot of, of that JSON, you know, <coughs> at any time and, you know, use it for yeah. testing going forward. So I've seen various approaches used and it's, it's tricky, you know, especially if um, you're expecting to have a monster, you know, data set to like seed a, a repo. Yeah. Um, exactly what would the best way to regression test against that? I'm not sure. I, I think, I think, you know, I'm, I'm open to other ideas, but yeah, as a lot of people know, I've been doing data centric work for a really long time and testing what you actually collect against a metadata service that tells you what you should expect is I think the most robust way to account for all of the things that can change in that pipeline. There's, there's, you know, proving that the software works consistently doesn't necessarily prove that you're getting, you're going to get the data. So a change in the GitHub API that affects what we're allowed to collect or what we do collect 
that may not show up in regression testing of the software only. The only way that we're going to know that that's happening is if we do a full collection from scratch on a set of repos and see a difference between what we collect and what the metadata says. So there are so many pieces in the pipeline that I, I don't think you can trust the data uh, is completely collected unless you have some kind of triangulation with the metadata service like GitHub provides for total commits, total comments, uh, total issues, et cetera. Yeah, and I think uh, it kind of takes us to the end of time. So we will make a few corrections based on what we learned here today with that little database glitch that we had and um, send out some updated docs to everyone. Great. Um, Max, thanks for joining us. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks. Andy, it's great. Kevin, you're good to see you again. Uh, hopefully, everybody found it useful, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Yes. Thank you very much for this walkthrough. And I put it on the agenda for the Grimoire call that we can talk about the user interface for adding and uh, maintaining the list of repos that we track. Maybe next week is too early. Maybe we have to put it in a future call. Yeah. Well, you all could look at our repo info worker and the repo info table in our schema. Um, it's collecting the metadata and triangulating it is not rocket science. It's, you know, it's obvious, actually probably something Daniel could do in a day um, and give you an external validation that the data collected is what the platform expects. Um, and you may be doing that already. You just don't know about it. So thank you guys very much. It was a really useful session for me. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, likewise. Good to see you all. Bye.